Hi, welcome back. Today I'm going to start a series of play on the old TSR game, Cromwell's Victory, The Battle of Marston Moor, designed by David James Ritchie, edited by John Pickens, illustrated by Roger Ropp, graphic design by Patrick L. Price, to name a few of the people listed in the credits. The game was produced by TSR in 1985. Introduction. The Cromwell's Victory Game is a tactical two-player game of the English Civil War battle at Long Marston on 2 July 1644. The combined Royalist armies of Newcastle and Prince Rupert met and fought the Allied Parliamentarian and Scottish armies, armies of Fairfax, Manchester, and Levin. If you purchase the game online, these are the components that should come with the game. You should get a 22 inch by 16 inch game map, one sheet of 100 colored playing pieces, and one 12 page rules booklet which contains all the information you need to play as well as the charts and tables. In addition you need to supply one six sided die and we can see that a hex grid has been placed over the terrain on the map to control the movement and positioning of the playing pieces. In this game, each hexagon, or hex, is individually numbered and represents an area 200 yards across. The cardboard playing pieces represent the actual military units and artillery pieces that took part in the battle. There are three types of uh, basic playing pieces. There are units that represent the brigades and regiments of foot, light horse, and heavy horse. There are leaders representing the named officers and their staffs that were actually present at the battle. And then we have artillery pieces representing groups of three to five guns. As you can uh, see from the sample unit here, Yuri Heavy Cavalry, it gives the name, the type of unit by its depiction. This represents a heavy cavalry unit. The combat strength is on the left, the morale rating is in the center, and the movement allowance is on the right side. And it also shows the setup picks. Back of the unit contains much the same information, name and type, as well as a reduced combat strength and movement allowance as well as the morale rating which remains the same and this like I said is in a this is a disrupted unit and they have certain penalties which we will see when we start playing the game. This is an example of a leader unit <coughs> this one in particular happens to be Cromwell himself he has his leader type symbol command rating on the far left side and a movement allowance on the far right side. He also has a setup hex. On the back of leader counters, they're blank. Next we have sample artillery pieces. The front is the at start condition and it has a hex number where it sets up at and it also has its artillery type symbol. The back indicates a captured <coughs> status. Enemy units can capture uh, enemy artillery units and use them against their former owners. And let's see, each strength point on the combat strengths, each strength point represents between 75 and 100 men, depending upon the type of unit. This is a brief example of the course of play. Other games are called the sequence of play, etc. First thing we have is uh, step one is the visibility phase. If it is game turn six or earlier, skip this step and go to step two. If it is game turn 7 or later, the Royalist player makes a visibility check 
according to the procedures detailed under visibility. Then we have the allied rally phase where the allied player makes a rally check for each and every eligible allied unit as detailed in the how to rally section and yes units must attempt to rally if at all possible. Then we have the allied artillery phase where the allied player fires, fires any or all artillery pieces that he controls at any royalist units he desires as detailed in the artillery phase rules. Then we have step four, the allied march phase. The allied player moves any of or all of his uh, allied units and leaders on the map as detailed in the how to move section. Then we have the allied combat phase, step five. The allied player attacks adjacent royalist units with his leaders and ordered units as detailed in 9.0 who must attack, 10.0 how to attack, and 11.0 combat results. Then we have the Royalist, Step 6 Royalist Rally Phase. The Royalist player makes a rally check for each and every eligible disrupted Royalist unit as detailed in 6.0. And the Royalist Artillery Phase is pretty much the same as the Allied Phase. The March Phase is the same. The Combat Phase is also the same. And then we come to Step 10, which we uh, advance the game turn marker one box on the turn track to indicate uh, let me see Let's flip this over here I guess to indicate the passage of one game turn the game turn marker is already on the last box of the turn track the game is over the rest of the game rules pretty much follow the how to play or sequence of play segment we have our visibility and we have the how to rally and then we have special rules on artillery. Excuse me here. Then we have, let's see, where am I at? Okay, it's not that far away. There we go. Then we have the rules on movement. Then we have rules on who must attack. Uh, there are zones of control in this game, however, they do not stop movement, but they do force combat. So, just to give you a heads up on that. And then we have somewhere down here how to attack, basic rules on figuring up odds and all that type of thing, and rolling a die. And then we come to the combat results. Figuring out where that's going to be at. Combat results, we can have attacker disrupted, defender disrupted, a disruption exchange, a defender eliminated, an attacker eliminated, or no effect. And then we talk about leaders over here on the other page <coughs> and what their abilities are. Basically, they can add to the combat strength of one combat unit they're stacked with. Also, they're important for rallying attempts with units that they are adjacent to or in the same hex. Then we have the concept of demoralization, somewhere over here, I'll find it, where if you lose a certain number of uh, units or strength points, that army can become demoralized, which is like a serious, uh, serious state of disruption. Okay, let's see what else we have here. We have how to win, but first, we have... Somewhere over here. Aha, here we go. Trains, baggage trains, and looting. Certain units can uh, will be forced to loot each side's baggage train as they get close to it, and that will cause them to basically just be out of the game for a while. And then we have the how to win, which is basically based on uh, victory conditions. And there's a there's a short game which only lasts about eight turns, I think. Just kind of gets you right into the fight. And then we have nothing but charts and tables at the end. Here we have what appears to be a period map of the actual battle deployment. Um, we have the Talkwith Village on the left and Long Marston on the right. To the south we have the hills in which the parliamentarians were drawn up in to face the royalists who are coming in from the north there. There's a ditch that runs the length of that 
road, uh, the road that leads between Talkwith and Long Marston. And it was also covered with, on one side with heavy brush. Anyway, this gives you a, a rough idea. I believe Cromwell's Plump is this area right here. And we have the Wilsup, the Wilstrop Wood. But somewhere around here we have the Close, the White Sky Close. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but they don't have it on this map. It was a scene of some of the final battle, battles. Um, I think the Scots were holding out there, or the White. Uh, I'm not sure what they were called. I think it was part of Newcastle's men, but they were a special type of unit. I think they might have been. Well, I don't know what they are. I'm not going to say if I don't know. Anyway, it looks like we have the horse uh, under Rupert. We have Porter's Division. We have Newcastle's White Coats. That's what they were. They were the White Coats. They held out in uh, the white sky close, and I think they were pretty much killed to a man. We have uh, we have the horse under Goring for the Royalists. Down here we have uh, Cromwell and Leslie. They're a heavy horse. We have Cromwell's foot. Um, I'm not sure whose foot that is. And we have Fairfax's foot. And we have Fairfax's horse. So anyway, that's a, a simple map of the air, area, era, battle, whatever. Here we have a view of the setup of the game as given in the how to set up rules. It is fairly accurate to the historical map that I have, and I have access to several other uh, historical maps of this battle. And it gives a fair representation of the unit played uh, pieces and stuff and where they're deployed, <laughs> deployed, deployed. We have Long Marston is down here, which I don't think you can see right now. Long Marston is here. Talkwit lies over here. We're looking at this from a little different angle, of course. Um, let's see. This is the white, white uh, sky close. Over here we have Cromwell's Plump, and off to the right here, you can just barely see it, this little area here, this is the Willstrop Wood, and that's pretty much it for some of the major, um, major landscape details. This is the, the ditch that lay between uh, Long Marston and talk with basically and uh, like I say most of the units are in very fairly realistic uh, order we have Rupert's units here we have Newcastle's white coats here and at the bottom we have the horse under gearing down here on the other side we have Let's see, Fairfax, Fairfax, I think this is part of Fairfax's horse down here, but it's not, I don't know if it's the Fairfax. Anyway, there were two Fairfaxes, and I always get confused, but up here we have uh, more Fairfax's foot, and up here we have Levin's army, Levin is somewhere around this area. And then to the very north, we have Cromwell's heavy horse up here, and Cromwell's foot. So, that is a fairly accurate order of battle and unit placement. Okay, I'm going to start playing this game. I'm going to take it kind of slow at first, give a few detailed moves and turns, and then we'll see what happens after that. I'll probably race through the game a little bit giving a turn-by-turn -turn, um, summary unless I something really cool happened and then I'll come back. I'm going to try and keep to the historical course by, you know, moving Cromwell's cavalry down here to engage uh, Rupert and some of the... Who else was up there with him? There was Rupert and... Uh, what's his name? Byron. Engage Byron's horse 
We'll move the we'll move the center here. And those two will come together, and then we will have. Uh, let's see. I just had the guy. Uh, who's down here anyway? Goring. We'll have Goring's cavalry come over here and attack uh, Fairfax's cavalry. And they'll probably swing around here to attack the baggage train, kind of like they did historically. And Cromwell was thrown back. And my camera somewhere in range here. Cromwell's horse here was thrown back by uh, Byron and Rupert's forces. But they rallied, they came on, they broke around over here. You can see it. While these two armies, foot armies, were fighting in the middle, they came back around and engaged the rear of the Royalist army. Um, Goring did come back, I think, but he was pretty much shattered and had no real effect after that, I think. I'll have to double check that. But anyway, they routed the Royalists once Cromwell's in, uh, cavalry got in the rear. I'll try to give a more detailed explanation uh, during the video. First thing we come to is the visibility phase. Really, nothing happens until uh, it's turn seven or later. But if it was turn seven or later, we would roll the die and uh, we would modify the result by adding two. If it's game turn eight, nine, we'd add a three. Here, wait a minute. Two if it was turn eight or nine, and then three if it's turn 10, and then four if it's turn 11, and five if it's game turn 12. What we're trying to do is get a, we're trying to get a six or higher base, basically. If the modified die roll is a one or three, visibility is clear. If it's a four or five, visibility is obscured. And if the modified die roll is six, visibility is minimal. So I guess we're trying to roll low. Anyway, and there's various uh, conditions on how visibility affects the play of the game. Rally would be the next uh, step. The ally player going first, of course. The procedure by which disrupted units regain full effectiveness is called rallying. You must make a rally check. The active player executes the following steps. Step one, active player finds the morale rating of the unit for which he is making the check. And we'll go over here. We'll look at uh, Goring's cavalry. Heavy cavalry has the uh, guy holding the sword up. Uh, let's see here. His morale check for the one Dacre, Dac Desire, Dacre, whatever. I'm going to call it. How it looks, Dacre, is a two. So he has to roll less than a two. But if he has a leader, in this indicate they'd be disrupted, by the way. I might as well just go ahead and make him disrupted for example purposes. Let's say he was disrupted on his disrupted side. I'd roll a one trying to get a two or less, and I get a six, which means that he would not rally. However, if his leader was stacked with him or he was adjacent to the leader, um, you get to add the command rating of the leader, which over here is a two, to the die roll or to the die, not to the die roll, but to the actual uh, rally number itself. So he would go to a four for his rally attempt. Now there's also a, uh, modifiers if they're in certain types of terrain, woods, the close hex, that type of thing. Anyway, that's pretty much what would happen, but we have no disrupted units at the first part of the game. Then we go to the artillery fire phase. The artillery fire phase for the allies um, is next. Artillery fire is fairly simple, but you know, it, it has to abide by line of sight and its range is attenuated based upon how far the target is away and it's also affected by visibility that kind of thing but basically 
if I were going to, where's he at? The 116, one we took a uh, look at earlier. If I was gonna use him, let's say to fire on Vane and uh, whatever's under him, maybe artillery. That's the thing, it's, they're stacking. However, that's usually just one combat unit per hex, plus an artillery, plus a leader. So that's all you can really have in a hex, and I don't think units can pass through each other, but I'll have to double check that. Firstly, I would, I would say they have to make a morale check or be disrupted if either of them tried to pass through, but anyway, that's not how it is, I think. So, what will you do? If I can find my tables and stuff. We're going to count up the hexes and see if there's any, uh, the hexes in between, we're going to see if there's any obstructions. At this point, I'm not, the ditch doesn't count, so we are one, two, three, four, five hexes away from Vane. Taking a look at the artillery table, we see that we have a range in hexes from artillery unit to the target, and then we have a die roll, um, series of die rolls on the left hand side, and inside the chart are the results. And you can fire past six hexes, I think you can pretty much fire across the board if you wanted to, but your chances of hitting are minimal. So I'm going to count the range again, one, two, three, four, five, so we will be on this column right here. We basically have a two and six chance of having any effect, but I'm going to go ahead and fire, because <clears throat> you might as well, there's no ammo. and. If it can help uh, disable a unit before you attack it, that's great, because two disables usually results in an elimination. We roll a six, and a six, as you can tell, on the five table, is a big fat zero, or in this case, a dash. So, that artillery fire would have no effect, and so on and so forth. Uh, the ally player would uh, roll his artillery fire, and then we would come to whatever the next stage is. What is the next stage? The next stage is how to move. So it's just basically movement. Like I say, you can move through enemy zones control, and, but you have to fight if you stay in the enemy zone control. Talks about movement stuff. Talks about terrain effects on movement. Then we have the attack. Each non-disrupted unit exerts a zone of control into the six hexes surrounding the one it occupies. All of the active player's ordered units in the ZOC of an enemy unit at the beginning of the active player's combat phase must be attacked. Must attack one or more enemy units during the combat phase and all that type of stuff. And the results are pretty much disruptions, misses, whatever, eliminations. So that's all what would follow next. So I'm just going to go ahead and move the units, kind of show you where we're at at the uh, end of the Allied movement phase um, of turn one, Marsh and Moore. Here we are at the end of the four o'clock turn. Cromwell's victory, Battle of Marsh and Moore, 2 July 1644. At the end of this turn, not a whole lot has happened. The Both armies have done some maneuvering. There was some cannon fire by the, um, the what are they called, Royalists, which disrupted this uh, parliamentarian unit. And we had, when, during the Allied phase, we disrupted that Royalist unit. Um, but other than that, <clears throat> other than that, Nothing major has occurred yet. The, both armies are just trying to get into position to set up their assaults. I can see it's going to be a really, really difficult time attacking across that ditch. Um, so it looks like everybody's going to be halved. And heavy horse units can charge into or out of or across this terrain, but... Yeah, everybody's going to be halved, it looks like. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention, uh, units of any type may not enter a town hex. So, let's see, I had a town hex up here somewhere. Nobody better entered it. Yeah, right here. Marston Grange. You can't enter that. You can't enter Long Marston. 
No units are allowed there. Uh, so, other than that, I don't think I missed too much. So anyway, I'm going to come back. We're going to have the 430 turn. The odd thing about this battle was, throughout the day, they fired some cannon at one another. Nothing really happened. Battle wore on and wore on, but nobody was fighting. Everybody was just, you know, <clears throat> hanging out, waiting for the order to attack. And then it got to be around 4 o'clock. And I think it was closer to 7 or 6. But anyway, about 4 o'clock, um, the Royalist armies were getting ready for to camp that night. They were making their supper and everything. And, and that's when Cromwell decided to take the initiative. And he rode his horse, like I said, mentioned earlier. He rode his horse right through... Um, Byron's horse forced it back before it regrouped and it, they fought out another little battle and then eventually they forced uh, Byron's horse off the field and they were able, like I, like I mentioned, to come back around and uh, get in the rear of the Royalist foot. So, anyway, it was kind of fought right there in the late afternoon, almost uh, evening. <clears throat> so around 7 o'clock, battle really occurred around 7 to 9 30 uh, in earnest so kind of an odd battle but it's quickly becoming one of my favorite uh, topics to uh, learn about anyway we'll be back later